Welcome to MemoQ Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to MemoQ Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of MemoQ Talks. Today, we're going to be talking with Mr. Adrian Probst, which I probably didn't pronounce his name right. We're going to give him a chance to do that in a second here. Um, Adrian is a very, I would, I'd say, pretty high-profile freelance translator. Um, he has a lot of experience in the industry. He also has his social media or YouTube site um, uh, called the Freelance Verse, with that has almost eighteen thousand subscribers and I believe close to eight hundred thousand downloads total, which is very, very impressive. Um, and so we're going to be talking to Adrian about, you know, some of the. What does it take to become a successful freelance translator and get some advice and tips from Adrian? But before we do that, let's welcome Adrian. Adrian, how are you today? Hello, Mark. Doing very well. Thank you. Excited to be here. And for all of our benefits, please pronounce your name correctly for me. Well, it depends. <laughs> what do you, you, you want the Swiss pronunciation? <laughs> sure, sure. That's Adrian Probst. Easy for you to say. Yeah, awesome. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. It's different if you hey, look in um, Germany. It's even more different in English and even more in French. So it doesn't matter. It's fine. So you're used to it. And 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 I have a kind of German sounding name, Schreiner. Um, and mm -hmm. people try to pronounce it all different types of ways. Actually, the, the, the most frustrating thing is the way to spell my name is very simple. It's uh, S-H-R-I-N-E-R. -E but everybody wants to put a C and another I and another E in there. And even when I spell it to them letter by letter, it's like, I'd say 80% of the time, they're just, just, just adding letters to it. <laughs> of course, yeah. It but, feels uh, natural because it's a profession yeah. in German, right? So it feels natural to write it in a German way. Cool. Um, hey, I, I got to say, this is my first podcast in about a month because I've been on this World One tour. I was in uh, Europe for business for 10 days, multiple cities, got back here, hopped in my car, spent one night at home, hopped in my car, drove to Las Vegas for the ALC event. Um, things caught up with me, got run down, ended up getting the COVID, but I'm back now. And um, I, I have to kind of just apologize for the settings that I'm in right now. I'm, uh, I'm in my last hotel before I get home. And um, I don't know, how do you, when you're on the road, do you, are you able to record a podcast while you're traveling or videos, yeah. I should say? First of all, like unbelievable, but <laughs> what you went through in the last month, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, I mean, right. Good Tell to, that to my boss. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely like, I, I usually uh, record ahead, right? I'm, I'm usually two, three weeks ahead on my YouTube channel. If things go very well, like they do at the moment, I'm even more ahead. Like now I have things planned until November and I don't have to worry about anything, which is wonderful. Um, but it, I'm it, impressed you have a plan. <laughs> I do. I do. Like it comes in waves. Like whenever it dries up, I, I feel that's because like, you're Swiss Swiss. Of course you have a plan. Probably, <laughs> like, right? that, yeah, I'm probably. the American guy running around with like a chicken with my head cut off. Yeah, no, but go ahead. I get re really anxious and nervous when I, when I have nothing planned for next Monday, cause I always publish on Monday. Right. So it gives me kind of the, the freedom uh. to. Even if it happens that I don't have anything, I still have a weekend before this Monday. So there's always something I can turn out that that's not the problem. But I like to to plan ahead. And uh, I sometimes even do on purpose record videos when I'm away because I think it kind of adds a nice flair to it sometimes. Uh, last year when I was in Morocco, sure. I filmed a, a video on like a, a rooftop terrace in Morocco. And you know, the feel is very different. And I like, I like to do it sometimes. Of course, it it can't stress me. If it stresses me, then there's no way. Uh, if I need a holiday, I take a break. Well, but usually I film when I'm in Switzerland or when I go to Hungary to visit my, my partner's family, then usually I just film normally from there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, one of the challenges is, is finding a place that um, the background noise doesn't, you know, kind of uh, intrude on the, the recording. And I, I don't know if, if it's different for audio and versus video, like, cause I mean, this is a podcast, but you're doing videos that you can kind of edit stuff. Um, but it, it's, it's challenging for me to find a quiet place. Like I'm in this, um, hotel that slash casino in the middle of Nevada and there's nothing around here. I probably could have just went outside, but there's the Wi-Fi wasn't um, working. That's the other thing was if you're recording a video, you don't actually need, you're not a slave to Wi-Fi like I am. Like we couldn't record this remotely if we didn't have a, a somewhat uh, stable Wi-Fi connection. But um, yeah, one of my favorite episodes, I, I interviewed uh, uh, 
Christoph um, from Topan Digital, and and I was oh, I was okay. in an Airbnb in San Diego, and it looked I had this little private little private little garden with palm trees and greenery, and it was just awesome. And it's like, wow, this would be a perfect studio. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I I th I think that you translate um from what uh, English, French, and Swiss. Uh, English, French into Swiss German and German. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, German is my well, Swiss German is my native language. And for those of the listeners that know that there is not really a written form of Swiss German, right? It's it is always High German in the way that it's written, but it's still there's a distinction to be made if you localize for Switzerland or for Germany because people are very different mentally, like how they uh, read things, how they want to be addressed, how they are more likely to buy things if you write marketing copy, right? So I market myself as a German translator with a focus on the Swiss audience because I know what it takes to to reach them. Yeah, So that that's kind of the edge that I can give myself because I don't live in Switzerland, so I'm not bound to the extremely high prices that the, the translators there need to charge to, to survive, right? Mm. Of course, I can still, right. and I always tell myself, I still compare myself to my Swiss friends, but still, like, I have this competitive edge of being an EU, uh, I mean, not citizen yet, but at least I'm living in the EU with, with, a, with an edge to the Swiss audience. Well, I mean, and that's that's one of the um, terms I picked up reading a Tim Ferriss book many years ago was uh, that geo arbitrage, where you know if you can charge a, a certain rate but live in a locale where with lower costs, um, then more power to you. In fact, I when I was in Singapore working for CLS Communication, which was is was a Swiss company that was acquired by Lionbridge, um, one of the coolest translators I met it was a, a Swiss German gentleman. And he specialized, and we're going to talk about the importance of specialization in a second, but he specialized in, in finance, in a very particular kind of finance called equity research. Um, and he would translate, I believe, into two different languages, into French and into German. Uh, and he spent six months a year in uh, Europe and six months a year in Hawaii, and occasionally would stop through Singapore. And it's just that ability to kind of do, you know, and just move around like that. So what, let me ask you, because I looked at your LinkedIn profile. You didn't start off as a translator. Um, I actually even saw that, I think you did um, a sales job and a project management job. Um, what pulled you into the translation field? Yeah, exactly. I started out as a, um, I did a business apprenticeship in Switzerland. We go to, after mandatory school, we got to, to do a three, four year apprenticeship to study a, a profession. Actually, it's, it's still quite rare that people go to university. Um, so it's a bit of a different system than in many other countries. And there I did a three, yeah, three year long business apprenticeship in a import export firm that produced uh, bakery machines, like these huge ones, you know, these lines that, that uh, yeah. for industrial baking. So there I learned quite a lot about business, but of course I was very young, right? I did this from 15 mm. to 18 years old. So it's actually, it's ridiculous that that's when you already have to decide what you want to do the rest of your life, right? Luckily, it's not the case. Like you make a first decision, but you can always switch. And that's what I did. So once I became a bit more like self-aware and knowing what I like, uh, I realized that uh, languages is my strong point. I still very much do enjoy the business side of, of what I do now, but I wanted to uh, combine this creative uh, aspect that I have in me with, with the business side. Uh, so I literally just looked through the list of university degrees that include languages. And I saw that there is one in Zurich with, with translation. And I was not aware at all that this was even a profession that you could study this. So it, it took me by surprise. Uh, I didn't have any like role models or like special moments that said, oh, I need to be a translator. It just by chance, I looked through it and this spoke the most to me. I went to university in Zurich, moved away from, from my hometown, uh, which was already a big step for me because I would have thought I, I stay in this area for all my life. Right. And then this kind of led to the life that I'm living now. Now I'm living in a different country and it's my whole, uh, like, of course, I, I work with German every day, very often, but still my whole life is now surrounded by English and French speakers. So it's language is now a, a common thread through my life. And um, yeah, after studying university, after studying translation at university, I ended up in a, in a translation agency in Zurich as a project manager, as you said. 
And uh, this kind of gave me the first in into the language industry, which kind of uh, I like in retrospect. I like how it turned out because now I have both sides of the picture, right? I know what it's like to be a PM. Sure. Uh, I think a lot of translators are missing this link and uh, get very frustrated with them sometimes. Um, but if you've yeah. lived it yourself and if you have had these projects with 28 languages Friday evening and you need to assign them all, right, then you know the struggle. Yeah. So, uh, and that gives me kind of a more compassion towards towards these people, I think. Absolutely. Well, actually, there's a couple things I want to touch on there. The, 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 the Swiss system for internships, and I don't think it's just Switzerland. I think there's several European countries that have something similar. I think is awesome because uh, the problem we have in the States is if you don't go to university, uh, you get a high school diploma and, and what, right? And so where are the skills? And for example, I, I know that Florian, for example, I think he did an internship and actually worked as an electrician um, mm -hmm. before he got into the, the localization space or the translation space, which is really cool. And, I, and, I, and, and, and just as a, you know, an aside here, having been on this planet for half a century, I think that having these kind of different experiences all at the end of the day help us because you kind of are able to f discover patterns and relationships between different industries. And um, I think it kind of helps you accelerate your learning curves, the more broader experiences you have, uh, actually. So that's, that's great. Absolutely. Um, and then and if I can add something the, to that the, as well, like what sure, it also sure. creates is a, a much stronger economy in a country, I feel like, because you have much more value on professions that are viewed as uh, lower class professions in other countries have very highly educated people in Switzerland, right? Like if, if yep. in other countries you would say someone, I don't know, someone who's a hairdresser or someone who builds roads is kind of like a last destination if you haven't gone to university, which then is paid badly. Whereas in Switzerland, it's a three year uh, apprenticeship, as I said, or, or even four years sometimes. And the, the wages are then also uh, respectively high enough. And that creates a very competitive market, of course, if you value each and every profession because they are all needed and equally important. I think during the pandemic, 100 percent agree that, that, that these professions are even way more important than a lot of overpaid professions, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, just for, like you said, the, the general economy, also just the general satisfaction. I mean, if people, if people feel that they have a skill, I mean, I know like if, if, if whenever I feel like I have some kind of um, ability in a particular arena, I feel better about myself. Right. But if you graduate from high school and you're like, okay, so what am I going to do? Work at McDonald's? Um, you know, I mean, we have so many people in this low end service industry jobs. Nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that, but if the education system would have provided them with a skill that they could go out and be do some type of trade work um, and the, like the examples that you just mentioned they're going to contribute more to the economy and they're probably going to be a little bit happier but i digress okay let's uh let's go back to translation so um and i also I, actually before we get in that working as a project manager i think is awesome i think everybody should have to spend a week as a project manager especially salespeople, um because they have no idea of the pressure that project managers i think it's the toughest job in loc um, because you have to deal with customers salespeople, translators um all kinds of different file formats and types and deadlines and everything and it's just like it's the, the burnout rate or the turnover rate in a lot of companies is, is incredibly high. So um, I think it's a great experience for you because I'm sure now it's kind of like if you've worked at a waiter as a waiter or a waitress, you're going to probably be more um, polite to the service staff, right? Exactly. <laughs> the you same worked example. as a project manager. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you understand the pressure when they call you on Friday night and say like, I need help. And you, you get that, right? I mean, you understand where they're coming from. So let me ask you, um, <clears throat> Because, I mean, you've told this story before, so I, I kind of want to um, maybe take, take it um, in a slightly different direction. But what would your advice be in terms of I, I, specialization? I think you specialize, I think it was in IT, and then there's also sports there. So I want to touch on sports in a second. But what's your, why should somebody specialize in a, in a particular text type, for example? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. That's a topic that I, I like to speak about anyways, but uh, it's uh, it's also a big topic on my YouTube channel. I have a series there called Specialized where I invite different people on and talk about different specializations because I think it's a really important topic that is on one hand, as I just said, very important, but on the other hand, also a bit 
overvalued in many cases when you when you especially when you're working out uh, when you're starting out right um, it's really hammered into everyone's brains that you need to specialize even even before starting and it's so sad because i get comments all the time saying i wish i could start already but i don't have a specialization yet and that that's not the point, right? You, I, I try to tell people that it's perfectly fine to start out without a, a specialization. You can start out as a generalist. You can stay a generalist as well. It, it, it's not, it doesn't mean that you are less of a, of a good translator if you don't have a specialization yet, right? It often happens that you don't choose it to specialization, but the specialization comes to you. It chooses you in a way, right? Because you are just starting out, you're taking the jobs. Of course, don't make a mistake and take very highly technical jobs and just screw it up. That's, that's not good for any uh, kind of party, but there are so many more regular, more general work that, that any translator can do that is good enough. And uh, then you kind of find out what you like, right? If, if you do your first game localization and you realize, hey, that's actually really cool. I, I really like to do that. Then you can uh, educate yourself more in this direction. That's what happened to me as well. Like I never thought I would specialize in sports, um, but then I found uh, a big uh, sports retailer as a client and I kind of went from first doing their marketing stuff, more into sports journalism, more into article descriptions, etc. And I really loved it. So now I'm really pushing this specialization more and more. And now it's, I think, already overtaking my IT side. So you can really... Once you find the niche that you really want to specialize in, you can go for it 100%. In terms of why it's important, uh, there are clear things like uh, you you can charge more because you are a specialized expert in it, right? You can, you're more attractive to your clients because they probably trust you more. If, if you work with a with a company that sells hunting rifles, they will not... Uh, want to hire someone who is really against hunting and doesn't like the the, the, the morality right. aspect of it, right? You need to find someone that shares a passion with you. And if you can provide that, the, yeah, of course, that's, that's even better for you. Uh, but then you have to just realize that it's great to go very niche and very, very specific. But it, I would always recommend if you do that, also have a more general aspect. Like if you really go into hunting rifles maybe also go into the general like shooting sport you know not always only for uh, too too um, specific as you have to weigh out is there enough like, of course it's amazing to be so highly specialized but sometimes there's not enough work there right i think that's some some, some great great advice and um, i think you can apply that advice to just your career in general go to the areas that you enjoy and if you enjoy it you'll excel at it. And as you excel it, you'll enjoy more, you'll get noticed and um, good things will happen. You know, you, you mentioned sports and I've never thought of sports as a specialization. IT I get, legal I get, finance I get. And e in each one of those industries, you can actually, even IT itself is such a broad area, right? So, you know, you can go into cloud, you can go into cyber, you can go into uh, all kind of anomaly detection. Um, and the same can be said with finance. With sports, I, I just thought it's kind of like pretty general. Can you, you know, but explain to me, like, um, one, what, what sports are you, do you really like covering it? And, and how are you specializing other than player names and things like that? Yeah, I mean, exactly as you said, like in IT, sports is also a huge market, right? Like, I would never take anything on that is. Yeah about American football or something because I have, I have no idea about it, right? So <laughs> I, I do, in terms of actual sports, like the activities, the most I do is is uh, football, basketball, and skiing. These are the three that I'm passionate about, that I manage to find clients in. So I am working, especially in football, I work, I'm working with big organizations that, you know, publish uh, on one hand, on one hand, uh, product copies or like retail products of, of uh, boots, of jerseys, etc., trying to sell them. And on the other hand, really sports journalism about um, articles, about players, about competitions, uh, the, the history of the sports, etc. Uh, of course, that's quite niche and there are not many people who are doing it successfully. But the great thing is that once you manage to build a kind of a notoriety and a, a clientele in it, you get very quickly to the really nice clients, right? Because, for example, in another field like medical or, or IT, where there are so many, 
you can be very good, but it's still very tough to to get to the. I don't like to call it the top, but you know what I mean to the to the well. Yeah, yeah, to get recognized right? as yeah as a real subject matter expert. Exactly. No, that, that's yeah. that, that's awesome. I, hey, I got a little. I got a little. Go ahead. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I I have a little um, English football trivia for you. Okay, so okay. <clears throat> when you when you score a goal, we say you score, right? Do you All know right. that where that word "score" comes from? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back back uh, in in England in the UK back in the day, um, when you would get a goal, they would actually the goals were just posts back at then. Mm -hmm. There was no net or anything like that. You had two posts, and if you got the ball between the posts, um, that was a score. But to 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 track the 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 number of goals, they would actually score, which means to cut or carve a line in the um in the the post, the post. And so the, and, and right. so yeah 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 so when you score has a couple different meanings but in one meaning it means to kind of lightly scratch something and so they would actually do that i've been told that one of my good friends in japan is british and he's a rugby and soccer historian and every time we meet he um he bombards me with these little facts. <laughs> so, that is an like, amazing I, I don't know anything about soccer or rugby. <laughs> I, I will use that fact if I may in other conversations. Yes. <laughs> Please, just impress the hell out of yeah, people, man. <laughs> They're going to be like, okay. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, um, score as a, you know, there's as a another kind of specialization. Something. That's true, actually. Uh, okay. For example, instead of the, the text type, um, you could do value added. For example, if you are doing um, trans creation or SEO optimized translation, what are your thoughts on that type of a specialization as well as the text types specialization yeah. or in contrast to or in addition to? Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking about this because also as, as part of this uh, specialized series, I'm always thinking what would be the next uh, you know, what would be the next topic? And I ask my audience, which one would you like to see next? And people write all kinds of um, yeah, suggestions like political translator, media translator, etc. And then someone actually said uh, SEO translator. And it made me think that's a really interesting approach because then you don't specialize in a content, but in, in making content more SEO friendly, right? And I was thinking if that sure. could actually, I mean, of course it can be a specialization, but then you're still working with different topics, right? With different content. So I wonder if you can be an SEO translator and then just translate medical texts because you, I, I honestly, I don't know enough about it, but it's, it's an so, interesting debate. So, yeah. yeah. I've spoken to a couple of translators, uh, Tess Witte, for example, and Maria Scheibengraf, uh, they they offer that. Um, I think Tess really focuses in IT, the IT space. I can't remember with what um, subject matter uh, that uh, Maria focuses on, but they do the translation and then they're just picking the right the the the, the word that would help the SEO lift or to optimize the search engine uh, results. And so you're kind of inserting that. Sometimes the customer can actually. Um, a, provide you know the words that they would mm -hmm. like you to use because those are the words they're going to give them that seo lift um and and so your job as a translator is to kind of fit those words in in an appropriate way you know because obviously if you force it it's going to sound kind of clunky right yeah. so there is it's it's part science part art um but you know i mean since uh, i guess it also depends on ultimately where the content is going to be if the content's in a magazine and there's no online version of it, maybe nobody cares about the SEO, but if it's primarily web content, you know, so yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I've never, uh, I know people who are writers and of course market themselves as SEO writers uh, or copywriters, but I have been asked to write uh, in SEO friendly format, but I've always turned it down because I'm just not comfortable in doing it. I would need to do education first in it. Uh, so whenever I've been asked to do anything SEO re related, I've turned it down. But it's definitely an interesting avenue to go down. Um, well, if you, I you, ever... you, you bring up a, a, a yeah. you bring up a question. Sorry to c cut you off because you turn it down. And how do you decide when to turn something down? Because especially when you're first getting started, I would think that 
the natural tendency would be never to say no because you just want to say, you know, and you want to build up your customer base. And I don't care what the rate is. I don't care what this topic is. I'm going to do it. I mean, how do you balance that? And in, in, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the first uh, uh, inclination to take everything on and people will do it and people will regret it. I've regretted it as well. Very badly. <laughs> I remember it so well in 2016 when I started out, I, I took on a job because it looked so cool and I really wanted to do it. It was subtitling uh, SAP um, like tutorials, you know. Uh, I thought, yeah, why not? I've worked with SAP before, never done a subtitle before, only in university, never in real life. I took it on. It was unbelievably hard. I, I remember I moved my desk into the living room because I couldn't <laughs> stay in my office anymore. I needed a sp change of space and I just worked the whole weekend, uh, almost 24 hours, completely burned myself out. But it's an important lesson and, you know, it stays with you and you then realize that you never want to do that again because uh, then you realize that once you get paid and you deduct the taxes, it was not worth the, the hassle and the stress you had, right? And then... Yeah, you learn it day by day. It still happens to me. It happened very recently that I took something on that I did my normal like judgment if I thought I uh, would be suitable for this. And I thought yes, and it turned out that I wasn't, which is fine. It happens uh, to everyone, uh, but you, you get better in judging, uh, especially like obvious things when it's legal, when it's medical, anything that can be potentially life-threatening or very very uh, bad for you if you make a mistake in legal. I completely stay clear from that. Uh, if it's a bit more general and something that, you know, just recently I did a, a gaming um, article about the game League of Legends and they wanted a, a, a translator with experience in playing this game, uh, which they didn't find. And then they came back to me and they said, oh, you have experience in gaming, but not in this one. Would you take it on? And I said, look, I can try, I can do it, I can do my research, but I've never played it. So just, you know, I was hedging a little bit, but sure. they, they said, yeah, please go ahead. And it was great. I learned a lot of things and uh, found that I really like this game. Yeah, it's it depends. As with almost any question in, yeah. in the localization industry, sure. it depends, right? Well, I, I think the important thing is there is that um, translators, when they first get started, they need to be aware that it's okay to say no. Yeah. And sometimes it's better to say no and it will free you because if you commit to a job that you don't have the subject matter expertise, the other one is pricing. I, I know that, um, you know, new translators, they're, they get, can get beat up on the pricing and it's tempting to take everything. And maybe you do because if you've got the capacity and it's, it helps you with your experience, but you kind of have to balance that with then you starting underpricing yourself in the market or you um, you might even get burned out. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you're just translating for pennies on the dollar, right? So, exactly. Yeah, it's um, really not positive for anyone. Yeah? Like your client will not be happy. You will not be happy. You will get sick from it. You will not pay, be paid enough from mm -hmm. it. So there is no, there's no benefits of taking something on that you initially internally know that it's not good for you because mostly we have this this inkling right we kind of know i shouldn't take this on but i have nothing else so i'm just gonna go ahead but <laughs> you rather use this time in doing doing a, a cpd or something and just go go further down the like do some voluntary translation that in your specific industry that you want to specialize in uh, it's gonna help you in the long term way more but of course like I'm not oblivious to, to the situation that people just need money to survive, right? If you are in this in this situation where you just need to pay your bills, forget everything we say and just try to make it work. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give that medical device translation, give it a shot. <laughs> what's the worst that no. can happen? Hey, um, <laughs> what's the worst going to happen? I mean, yeah, they're not, they're, you're not going to be using that device. Hey, so... Um, let me ask you this, and and if um, you know you can, if it's too personal, then you can you know you can just answer at a very general level. But in you know you are running your own business, right? And one of the challenges of what running your own business is you're not just doing one job. You know, you for example um, are very a very active marketer, which I want to come back to you and talk about um, marketing efforts. But then you you also are somewhat of a project manager because you have to schedule and and figure things out. And 
you're also obviously a translator, but then you have things like finance. And so my question is, is like, how do you manage and track your finances and, you know, and, and what things that you can write off and expenses and all that stuff? Because, you know, it, it can be kind of challenging because you're focused on your day-to-day business, but you also have to manage that stuff because you do have to pay taxes and you do have expenses and, and so on. So what do you do for that? Absolutely. So luckily finances, I am now in a position that I can completely outsource that. So I, I uh, since I moved to Belgium, which was 2018 now, yeah, exactly 2018. This was uh, already three, two and a half years after I had started my business. So my uh, clientele was stable. I had a stable income and I managed to luckily not have to uh, (laughs) dive deep into the Belgian uh, tax and social security system because it's extremely confusing. Anyone who lives here and listens to this can attest to that. Uh, So I just, once I moved here, I hired an accountant. I uh, got my recommendation off of a Facebook group that is uh, uh, translators in Belgium. And I asked if someone has a good accountant that knows uh, the way around, you know, se- setting up as a, for me, also non-EU because I'm, I'm Swiss, right, uh, within right. the EU boundaries and for freelancers. And I got a very good recommendation, which is actually close to me here where I live. And I went in there in the office and I had a great talk and I immediately felt like this person is not going to, uh, have his or yeah it was it is a man so I'm not gonna have his interests in mind but but rather mine because he works for a company he's not a self-employed so I, it just felt like you know he's gonna do the best for me and uh, mm-hmm. that's why I started working with him and have been ever since every quarter I give all my receipts uh, to him uh, he, he deals with the VAT and then uh, does my uh, income what is it called? The tax declaration, right? And also my sure. social social security prepayments. Here in Belgium, I have to pre- prepay everything, all my taxes, etc. Is prepaid, which I like because then you're not you don't have to like put the money away and then pay all the the rest. Big in, surprise at the end of the, year, of the right? year! Hey, guess what? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So luckily, all the finances are are now. Uh, how, uh, how about um, how about customer invoicing? Does he do that for you too, or do you do that yourself? No, no, I do that myself. I do that myself. Okay. So I do that on the first of every month, or well, the first working day of every month. I invoice all my invoices uh, of the past month, uh, which is always like it, it. It it looks bigger than it actually is. Once it's over, I feel like oh, that was easy, but it always it's kind of a drag. I don't like to do it, but of course, it's what makes me money. So I still want to do it regularly because once you get in the in the habit of doing it late, then you don't get paid on time, right? So I really try to do it to the first working day of every month. And it takes me maybe a, an hour, maximum 90 minutes or so to do all my invoices. And uh, like that, I can keep a regular income, which is very important if, if you are self-employed. Well, and I, I'm sensing, I mean, it's important if you're self-employed is you, you have things planned out. You release content every Monday, you do your invoices on the first working day of the month. And I, it's, it's good to have that stuff calendared. Um, and, and just because like you said, if you, um, if you don't invoice, you don't get paid. Speaking of which, uh, so do you, do you, do you just track projects in Excel or do you use some kind of software that allows you to track, you know, okay, this customer, this invo- this amount, so on and so forth. I do use Excel until now, and I'm about to switch. I'm about to uh-huh. collaborate with a company that wants to work with me for the YouTube channel, and uh, they offer this this uh, uh, exactly what you said now, like a customer tracking software. So I'm probably about to switch uh, this year still, that it will be a bit more professional. But right now I still do Excel, and it's perfectly fine, right, for everyone yeah. starting out. You don't need to, to buy a, an order tracking software at all. You can just do it in Excel. I have my sheet there. Uh, I, you know, made a couple of functions that I, when I finished a job, I can just click a, a little box and it it puts it in a different color. It puts it in yellow. And then once I invoice it, it puts it in green. And when it's paid, it puts it in another shade of green. So it's all, it's nice. all structured. It's all good. Uh, that's, yeah, as you said, like, I like to be planned. I like to plan ahead and be organized which is super important if you want to be a freelancer, like self-discipline and uh, willingness to organize yourself and be structured is so important. 
if you are the person that says, oh, I would never like get up in the morning. Like if I didn't have a boss, I would just sleep in. Just know that the deadlines are your boss, right? So you will mm. still have to wake up and uh, you definitely need a very high uh, amount of self-discipline and willingness, like self-motivation, you know what I mean? If you want to work on your own, because if no one is there to tell you what to do, you have to be the one that forces you to do things. So how do you manage um, that, that whole work-life balance? Because, you know, I could see a job coming in and then your friends say, hey, let's go grab um, dinner or something. And you're like, ah, so, I mean, I, I would think that no matter what, there's always going to be some tension there. Um, how, how do you manage that so that you can kind of reduce that tension? Yeah, I'm not even, even that, that sure. Like it, it just... Uh... In the beginning, I didn't manage it at all. I just uh, tried <laughs> everything. I worked on the weekends. I worked in the evenings and nights. And I started next to doing a full-time master's degree, right? So I, when I look back at the years like 2016, 17, I don't know who that was. I, I don't even... I mean, was a different kind of beast. <laughs> so I, That's I, never going to change. That's, that's never going to change. I look back two years ago and I was like, oh, I'm such an idiot. And I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm proud of this person because it, it worked out, but it's unbelievable. I couldn't do it anymore. Now it's just kind of, I don't know, I guess it's experience. It just works out. Of course, one big step that I did when I realized that I, my work-life balance is not good uh, is I deleted everything work and social media related off my phone. I didn't want to have anything to do that. So uh, no work emails, no LinkedIn, no, well, LinkedIn is back now, but. I managed to <laughs> deal with it that day, but just emails and social media off the phone that helped a lot. So whenever yeah. I left my office space, uh, that's another big uh, tip for everyone. Like have your dedicated office space and leave it once you're done and don't go back. Uh, because if you if you work just in the living room or something where I am now for this interview, <laughs> just the lighting is nice. <laughs> then you will always see the laptop and you're always tempted to go back to your emails, right? So. Uh, dedicated space where I work and no work-related things on my phone helped me a lot. And now I just, I guess I manage what I'm capable of doing in a day. So I i am i have very nine to five or rather like eight to six working hours now. And it's, it's kind of weird for a self-employed person and many people don't understand. But for me, it's important to have this regularity. Because uh, I don't want to, as you said, I don't want to work when everyone else is going out and inviting me, right? So I, I manage to, even though I have my own hours, I manage to have very regular working hours. Excellent. Um, and I think, you know, your advice doesn't just apply to freelancers. I think it does, doesn't matter what your job is. It's important that when you're not in the office to shut the emails off and be in, be present wherever you are, whether it's with your family, having a meal. I, you know, one of the habits that I, I tried to change is I used to like, while I was eating would be looking at my phone and, you know, half hour go by and I wouldn't even know what I was eating. You know, it was just like, so I try mm -hmm. to, unless there's something incredibly urgent, which there really typically never is. Um, I just put everything away, enjoy my meal. Right. And, um, and if I'm with my friends or with my family, the phone, and if I catch myself, it, sometimes it's like subconscious, you take the phone out and I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no, just put it away. <laughs> But uh, right. so that's you, important you advice. Check what time it is, but then you realize you don't have, I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> it exactly. Didn't look. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hey, um, so, let's yeah, come back to like oh, go ahead. Go conscious ahead. eating, conscious like going for a walk and actually being present in the walk and not have I don't know, not be on a conference call or listen to any kind of podcast except for yours, of course. <laughs> should listen to <laughs> but all these likewise, I'm always listening to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did. I, I did watch several of your videos. Um, I I love your videos. Uh, I, you know, you. I listened to the one, uh, well, a couple of them on specialization. One was finance. Another one was the game localization. And it was interesting because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're different. The way they look at their jobs is completely different. Also listen to you on Slater pod. Um, and I saw your memo fest video. I, you, you do a really good job of, in my opinion, you, you have professional content. It's well-structured, but it's also very friendly and accessible. It's fun. And that's, I think that, that you, you have that yeah, kind of a really nice balance there, um, which leads me to my question if, you know, how important should everybody go out and make a YouTube channel or should everybody do some type of self-promotion and marketing? Um, and so explain why you did it. And then what's your general advice for other freelancers? 
Uh, no, it's definitely not for everyone, right? You have to be the type of person. You have to enjoy doing it. You have to have time doing it or make time doing it. Um, for me, exactly what you described, what my channel is, was exactly the goal, right? I'm a very big fan of, of YouTube as a platform. I follow many content creators on there uh, in various different fields. And I knew exactly that this aspect, what you just said, like a kind of a professional content, but with a with slight humor, with slight like re laid back, relaxed atmosphere is, is still missing in this industry. Uh, I spoke to several content creators that do videos about translation or used to do and kind of moved away um, because they didn't see the, well, some, I don't know if you know Robert Gebhardt, he just he was on my channel. He has a big YouTube channel about it. And he always says that he is not a YouTuber. He just shares his experiences and puts it on there. And he doesn't care about, you know, the backgrounds, the analytics and all that and the titles and the thumbnails and that's exactly what i enjoy right I, I love going into the analytics and obsessing with it and what can i do <laughs> how can i make the, the next one better and I, I knew that this would be missing and once i had the relevant experience to actually say something right there's no point in uh, giving advice on youtube when, when you don't know anything yet so once i had gathered like four or five years of experience i, I started it this was never an attempt to to brand market myself or was it i don't even know what it was it was like a you was three years ago you didn't know what you were doing you were just I mean, you were getting a master's degree you were learning you were getting customers and you were doing a youtube right? channel <laughs> this was a peak i'm, I'm surprised you didn't issue. run a marathon <laughs> <laughs> oh maybe actually why not <laughs> no that was like everyone was making weird decisions during peak lockdown i feel like <laughs> mine was to start a youtube channel and uh, you know i have ideas I, I went, I, I went Seven vegan for, I went vegan for like two weeks, man. I was like, I'm going to go vegan <laughs> and then two weeks. And I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. It could have easily ended up like this, but after two weeks, I'm like, no, but I, yeah, I, I always discuss my crazy ideas with, with my partner. And she says like, if they, if it actually has, has legs to stand on and this one, she said, yeah, why not just try it out? And I, I thought I just going to do it for a year also a challenge for myself because I kind of lost all structures like once COVID hit and I, I felt like I need some structure in my life again so this gave me a very nice structure like every Monday at 6 p.m I'm gonna just put the video out there whether someone watches it or not and see if I can actually stick to it it was also an exercise for me to be consistent to stick to something I want to do and uh, I started maybe this was in May I think or April 2020 and I made six videos before I started actually publishing them because I, I wanted to see if I like it. And then in July, I had six videos planned and I uploaded them scheduled for every Monday. And then it went on from there. And uh, of course, this is not for everyone. Not, by far, not everyone should do that. But I think everyone can make an effort to do something. Like it doesn't have to, to, to be video content. But just realize that if you don't put yourself out there, no one will know that you started as a translator, right? Who, who would right. know that? If you just build a website and, and then wait, like no one is going to find your website unless you are like a genius SEO marketer who knows everything about Google algorithms. And, the, and there are people out there that can do that, but um, no. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> but I, I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah, these people don't listen, yeah. but uh, everyone else... No one will find your website as a freelance translator. There are too many out there, right? But so but I like you, I, I like your point that you don't have to necessarily do videos. There's other social things no. you can do. You mentioned yeah. LinkedIn earlier. Um, there's actually you know in person things. I some of the most successful freelance translators um, that I've met go to industry events and they talk to everybody and they they are very specific. They say I specialize in this language pair this subject matter or text type and and here's who i'm working with and you know you talk to 10 people and one of them sooner or later might need your services absolutely that's something big i'm still working on um i was always uh, extremely shy and very bad in in like actual uh, real life conferences I, I enjoy going to them but i never had i always had good experiences and i enjoyed it but i never had uh, 
how do you say like conversions you know it never led to, uh, to really? finding okay. clients or or uh, or uh, something else so i'm still working on that and this youtube channel definitely pushed me and forced me to to meet a lot of people and it made me so much more confident and so much more comfortable with going out there talking to people that i always thought like why would they be interested in me right but you have to realize that without freelance translators this whole industry cannot exist right it, absolutely it, of course we are small and like work at our own home in our, in our corner but it's still the backbone of the whole thing right and once you realize that and yeah you, you can be proud of your profession you can be you can go out there and talk to to high-end business people and don't need to feel small just because you're not leading a team of 100 people right you are you're still doing something very valuable and uh, connecting the world and just realize that it matters what you do. And then once you realize that you can be much more confident in talking to people, and as you said, you can uh, be in person and not only on screen. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you this. Um, do you ever face an opportunity where a customer says, Hey, um, I had this project and it's, it's it, it takes more than you um, and we need other translators. Can you manage this and farm it out to other tr freelance translators? Because then then you're kind of going off of your specialty in terms of just doing translation. You're actually kind of starting to run or scale your business. Have you come across that opportunity? And if so, how do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have, especially in the last year. I've consciously made the, made the decision to do that more. Uh, mm -hmm. I before what I used to do is when I didn't have capacity or didn't have time, I would always recommend someone. So I would tell my clients rather than saying no to them, I would tell them I can't do at the moment, but I have this colleague who is specialized in this as well. So why don't you reach out to him? I have two very good friends and colleagues that, are, that we share uh, work with each other, you know, and uh, that's one way of doing it. But of course it doesn't like, benefit me financially right so there's also a way to actually yeah as you said scale the business and work as an intermediary rather than like almost as an agency right um and i've have been doing that this year several times and it's been interesting yeah um, it adds another layer of of um experience to to what you what you used to do because you need to select people right so it right. becomes kind of you become yeah, hiring manager next to everything else you do, right? Uh, which is super interesting, fascinating. And it, it helps me also then, again, making videos on the topic because I then realize what I look for if I look for a freelance translator, right? Sure. Uh, and then I can tell the people watching my videos, I can tell them exactly, look, if you want to be noticed, I was looking for a, for a German translator that can help me with something in, in a specific area that's how I found him or her, right? So then it gives again value to the community, which is um, the whole goal behind the channel. Um, it's in, it's an interesting aspect. I, I don't want to do it too much. I don't want to transform my business into a full-fledged agency because I do kind of have, I, I, I can't really explain what my plan is, but I have kind of a plan what I want to do with my business in the next five to 10 years. And it is not a traditional agency because I feel like they will not be needed in the same way that they exist now. And so, uh, but whenever someone asks me what the plan is, I can't explain. So don't even ask me. I have well, like well, a weird well, plan. Let me ask you this then. I mean, because that's, that's yeah, a really interesting yeah. point. Um, what do you think will change in the industry that agencies will not be needed as they are today? So, you know, and just talk at the level that yeah. you feel comfortable um, of course, of course. I just feel like the, the normal transaction that we know now that the company goes to an agency, needs a text translated, the agency goes to a freelancer, translates it, proofs it, and sends it back as an intermediary. I don't think that this will, it will be needed still, but not at this scale anymore, right? Because the workflow will probably change completely. And I think like translator as a, as the profession as we know it might I mean, we don't even know what will change, but I think a lot of changes will come. And I think we will more rather need uh, something like language optimizer, maybe language consultants, right? Someone who, who works much more closely with the end client that probably uses more technology, more AI implemented systems to produce their content and rather has a language consultant on site maybe, or directly works with someone that uh, helps them provide value for the end customer rather than 
being the translator who works on the text themselves. So it's it's a very hard. I'm, I'm still figuring out how this workflow will look like and what it will look like, but I'm trying because now, now I just started hiring people and I started hiring my first person for my social media because I don't want to, as I said, YouTube is yeah. my only social media that I like. So the rest is done by someone else. And I think what, how I see this structure, what I want to build is more like a net rather than a, a company with a hierarchy. You know, I would lo- rather sure. have different people for different on the same level. And um, yeah, as I said, very hard to explain, but I feel like the trend this tra- traditional transaction, how we know it will change completely. That's, that's very interesting. And then um, I, I'm not going to editorialize too much, but obviously there are portals out there where um, it, there's an opportunity for enterprise customers to go direct. Uh, at the same time, there's still some a, a lot of comfort level in very large, complex, um, sensitive projects to work with an agency that they can trust to management because that's that's a huge thing. I mean, really, what is a translation agency? It's somebody that you can trust to get the job done. And if you don't have the trust, there's no agency. There's nothing there. Um, and so, yeah. you know, and if you can, if if the technology evolves to the, to the level. Um, and you were talking AI and machine translation, automated workflows. If it evolves to a level that you can kind of cut the agency out, it's it, it, that I, I could see that. Brings up another question. This guy, I got two more questions for you. Um, if you get approached and say, "Hey, um, we're using MT, but we need somebody to go through and post edit this or to check it," do you accept those jobs or do you say, "No, that's not my core expertise"? That depends a lot that? on the on the specific client and on the conditions of the job. Um, I do machine translation post editing for some clients. Uh, At the moment, I can still manage to get paid by the hour from all of them. Um, That is Mm -hmm. something that makes sense for me because how I view it then is like a normal editing job, which I like to do all by the hour because it depends so much on the quality of the text, right? And if I get paid by the hour, then I don't really care whether it's machine translated or not, right? I do my job and I get paid for whatever time I I invest. Uh, So I'm not opposed to it anyways. I feel like no one should be opposed to it because it's coming more and more, whether you like it or not. Uh, So I I don't actively seek out to find these jobs, but if uh, I get approached by a new client or an existing client, then I just lay down my my, uh, conditions that I have. I say, I, I can't do this by the word. Otherwise, you need to provide me examples of the quality of the output um, so I can actually judge how close this is to an actual translation. Uh, because if the quality is bad then, and you're paid by the word, you will make hardly anything by the hour, right? So uh, how I, I, would, I, I, would I, not, a... I would not turn it down immediately, but I would uh, investigate if it makes sense for me. Yeah, yeah. it totally makes a sense and it's nice that you're open to working on those opportunities there are some purists that say no i'm a translator i'm not an editor um and there are people who specialize just in editing and you know you're yeah. you're, you're open to both depending on the conditions um i was gonna say i i at one point um got paid this is many many years ago i was in taiwan and somebody said hey i need somebody to edit these translations and they were the world's worst translations and i I have a fair amount of experience writing and editing. And I thought like, okay, but I got the translation and the quality was so bad that I just not only, I mean, I got paid for it, but it it was hard work, but it was, it it was frustrating. And it made me angry that because I, it's like, who would translate this? Like one example was they'd, it was, this was a a marketing brochure. And basically they just repeated the same paragraph over and over and over again. And I'm like, you can't do that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And I can edit it, but you can't just repeat you know what I mean? The, the marketing yeah. guy or the, the translator has got to understand that they have to change it up. And I was, so um, I can understand the frustration that uh, post editors would face. But like you said, if the, if the conditions are right and acceptable, cool. Last question. Um, top advice for uh, any freelancer out there in the market right now, what do they need to be aware of in the next year? And, um, and, 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 and what would you recommend? And that's a really broad question, but I'm just, there must be something top of your mind. People already working in the industry? Sure. Hmm. That is a tough question. Um, the things that I 
have on the top of my mind now is exactly tied to what we talked about now is technology, machine translation, AI. Um, I think many people are worried. Many people ask in my comments, should I get into this industry? Should I really follow this or will I not be needed, right? Um, I tell everyone that five years ago when I started as a freelancer, I attended a, a conference or not a conference, it was like a an event by my university in the Netherlands um, on, on machine translation. Google had just announced a new uh, neural machine uh, impl implementation. And uh, I was told twice there that within five years that this profession will not exist, right? That will not be needed. Uh, this was now six years ago and I'm still very much needed. Everyone is still very much needed. So I always tell people that it, there is really no point in, in worrying about about this uh, impending like threat if it's you, you will you will never know what will happen right we can't right. even compre comprehend the, the technologies that will advance in the next 10 to 15 years so uh, i tell people if you if you love this industry if you follow and don't only do it because you love for language and you want to make a little bit of money next to it with it right take it seriously and become a a, a language service provider become a language expert and not only only a translator, right? This translation is not all we do. Like I, I do so many other things in translation. As you said before, we are we are one man or one woman businesses. And uh, if you can really focus on that, focus on the values that you have to give to the industry, know that you're not just someone in, in your own corner, that doesn't matter. You are, we are the backbones of the industry. And if you can really focus on that and put yourself out there, connect with people, build a big network, then I think we will be needed for many, many years to come. As long as there are people who need to communicate, there will be need for language experts. And if you can really uh, establish yourself as one, then you will be fine. You will have a place to stay, definitely. I think that's some amazing advice and an optimistic and bright outlook. So thank you for that. That was awesome. Hey, I got one last uh, favor to ask. Uh, what, what are you drinking? Of course. Ah, Memo Q cup. There we go. Product placement. That's what, I've been waiting all the whole hour for this, man. <laughs> not even on purpose. It's so funny. Uh, when we started, Mark said, not oh, even... nice cup. <laughs> My favorite yeah. mug. So uh, everyone favorite should mug. come all to right. Memo Q. Now we're in the mug business. Okay. <laughs> hey, Adrian, really enjoyed this, uh, this conversation. You are a true uh, subject matter and domain expert, um, and you, you bring a lot of energy and uh, optimism to the to, to the to our industry. So thank you for that. And thank you for being on MemoQ Talks. Thank you so much to you as well and to MemoQ as a whole. You've been so kind to me and to the channel. So thanks so much. Thank you for joining MemoQ Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on MemoQ Talks.